day today. Uh, before we begin, just uh, first of all, Pastor Shea is sick. He's not going to have his class tomorrow night. Uh, he's, uh, it looks like he's going to need another day or so to recover from that. Uh, but I also want to let you know that our other Bible st studies are up and running now. So if you're interested, there's just a whole bunch of them that are out there. Take a look, if you would, at our website, shorelinecc.us, and it'll give you all the different classes that are out there. Hopefully, uh, Pastor Shea will be back next week and feeling a whole lot better. He's got a fever and at home. So anyways, uh, over on the, the communion table over here, one of the things that we do at Shoreline is we make communion available every single week. And so once a month, we have it corporately as a family. But the rest of the month, we have the communion elements available over here. There's some scriptures that you can open to in, in 1 Corinthians 11 and read through there. Prepare your hearts if you want to do that. And during the worship music, we just encourage you to go ahead and, and partake. Now, we've tried using these prepackaged uh, communion elements, which are good. But I got to tell you, you've got to be really careful on the top to get the top plastic without tearing the, the, the grape juice open or you'll have a mess. So do the top one first to get the wafer and then do the bottom one. Uh, church has been going great. It's great to see everybody back once again. And uh, we're missing a lot of people at this point, but hopefully they're watching us online right now on Facebook Live. So if you ever can't be here, you can watch on, on that. Uh, we are ready to worship, and today we're going to be blessed by having our, our frontline student ministries leading us in that worship. So let's open up in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can gather here to worship you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And I pray today that as we sing these songs that we'll sing our hearts out. Lord, as we go into your word that you would speak to us in ways that we can apply to our lives. And we just ask for your presence to be here Lord, that you would be honored, that you would be glorified. And we, we realize that now we worship an audience of one. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can you please stand with us? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Remember, you can sit or stand, whatever you feel the Lord wants you to do. Oh, man. 
last song by standing. <clears throat> there is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our morning. cast out fear you are working in our waiting sanctifying us and beyond our understanding you're teaching us to trust your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. Faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You are wisdom unimagined. Who could understand your Surround if you will hold me 
to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the faithful forever and you are perfect in your love and I'm so grateful that you said that you will never leave us you will never forsake us Lord that you're always a prayer away and that you are sovereign you're in control there's no surprises to you so this day Lord as we gather here I, I just pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit to be here in a powerful way that you would speak to our hearts and Lord that rather than just hearing what's said that we would take these things and we would apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. And thank you so much to our frontline student worship team. I'm always blessed when they, they come up and leave, lead. And not when they leave, but when they leave. <laughs> How many dads do we have here today? Do we have quite a few? Happy Father's Day, dads. Today's really a special day, and I hope you have a fantastic day. All right, if you'd take your Bibles, open up to Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. Uh, the title of the message today is going to be Fellow Soldiers for Christ. How many of you, out of curiosity, have served in the military at some point? All right, quite a few of you then. Then you just might appreciate what I have to say coming up here. Back in 1976, uh, I joined the United States Army, and I remember I was, I was leaving here, and uh, we, we left from San Francisco, and as we flew, we ran into some different problems along the way, and uh, we missed meals along the way, and we're heading to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And so as we're going back there, it's getting later and later, we haven't eaten, uh, finally we get to the airport, there's no ride for us, we're starving by then. And so we're begging the people, we need something to eat. And they said, well, when we get to Fort Carson, we're going to go ahead and give you a meal. So we get there at about 1 o'clock in the morning, and we said, we haven't eaten yet. And the guy looked at us, and he laughed. And we knew the rest of the story from there, right? We weren't, we weren't going to eat. He said, but this is what I'll do for you. He said, I'm going to let you sleep in until, you, until 5 a.m. in the morning. By then it was 2 o'clock. I'm thinking, gee, thanks, but uh, we'll, we'll take it, you know. And so we get up there, we finally get in our bunks, we lie down. I kid you not, 4 a.m. in the morning, and I hear the most horrible sound. I hear the screaming and this yelling and the thunder of boots and all this noise. And I'm thinking, this is insanity. What have I gotten myself into? I will never do this. Well, an hour later, we were up. <laughs> and you guessed it, we were doing the same things that, that everybody else was doing. And when we're at basic training, everywhere you go, you got to run. You, you just run everywhere you're going. If you want to eat, you got these monkey bars that you got to go through, but they're not solid monkey bars, they spin. 
And if you fall, you got to start again. So you got to go through these monkey bars, and you get all the way through. You get in, and it's finally time to eat, and you're ready to eat. You sit down for five minutes, and they're screaming at you to get up and get out. And so you got to go out, and you got to scoop all that food that's left over into the garbage can, and you don't even get to eat. And I think the worst part of it was when they said they were going to give us a chance to rest. you remember that? Front-leaning rest position. Anybody know what that is? Push-ups. That's what you do all the time. But the physical part, I don't think, was as bad as the mental part. And some of the things that those drill sergeants said to us uh, were uncalled for. There was, there was no excuse. They were uh, telling us uh, who our mother was. They were telling us what our girlfriends were, were doing back home. And I got to tell you, I wanted to get up and I wanted to punch them. I really did. I, I, I wanted to punch them. And you think, this is insane. Why are they doing this to us? But as you go through, you begin to see that something happens over a period of time. And what they're doing is they are taking a bunch of independent civilians and they are transforming them into soldiers. And when you get in the battlefield, you need to be able to work together. You need to be able to move on an order. And what seemed like insanity on the surface actually had a purpose behind it, which helped us to develop in the men. Now, I didn't like the method that they did it, but I'll tell you, they got us to the point in which we were soldiers and we were able to fight if that's what we needed to do. Well, today we are in a spiritual battle, and it's not going to stop until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. As Christians, we need to undergo basic training. And for Christians, basic training in the faith. And for Christians, that can mean discipleship. Now, what is a disciple? A disciple is a learner. A disciple is a follower of. In our cases, Christians were learners or followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we grow in our faith, we need to be trained in the basics so that we can understand it. And when the attacks come, that we can defend our faith. It's said that 70% of the high school students that go into college end up walking away from the faith during that time. And I think too often as the kids are growing up in churches, we don't stretch them to the point in which they should go. We don't have the confidence in them to give them confidence in their faith. That's one of the things I appreciate about Jesse as she works with the students in, in uh, theology, as she works with them in apologetics, and she, she prepares them for what they're going to be facing in college so that when they get there, they, if they walk away, they've had every opportunity to understand the faith and to be able to defend it. And my hope and prayer is they won't. My hope and prayer is we'll look at these kids years later, and we're going to see them walking faithfully with Christ. Well, Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30, we see that Paul works with some younger disciples, and he develops them. And so we'll pick up the story right now in verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. In other words, when I know your condition. I've said many times that there's a lot in a name in a Bible. In fact, in the, the Bible, there's specific meanings when it comes to the names. Today, when we have our children and we name them, we sit down and we say, hmm, I wonder what name I like. And we kind of go by the sound of the name, and that's the name that we choose to name our child. In biblical days, there's something specific about that individual that's revealed in the name. In the name of Timothy, it means one who honors God. Now, Paul, remember his name was Saul, and it was changed to Paul. Paul's name means small. And here, you wonder why in the world would God change Paul's name from Saul to, to small? Well, when you look back at the persecution that he brought upon the church, I suspect that had something to do with the name that every time they heard the name, he, remi he was reminded of those things in, in which he had done. But anyways, when we're talking about Timothy, we mean one who honors God. As this story is going on right now, Paul's under house arrest in Rome. Uh, he's not sure what the outcome is going to be, but he's got his trusted assistant, his young protege, Timothy, with him. And uh, Timothy's there to help him. His desire is to send Timothy to Philippi to find out what's happening in the church at Philippi so that he can hopefully get a good report back. The church at Philippi had special significance to Timothy because it was Timothy who had helped Paul co-found that church on his second missionary journey. 
You can see the city of Lystra towards the center of the screen, just to the north there. And that's where Timothy was from. On Paul's first missionary journey, he reached his mother, he reached his grandmother. He may have reached Timothy at that point. Timothy wasn't ready to go with Paul at that time, but later on, Paul, during that second missionary journey, when he got to Lystra, found that Timothy had grown to the point in which he wanted to take him along as a disciple, uh, as, as uh, understudy, so that he could be right with Paul. Uh, when Jesus was ministering for the three or four years in which he ministered, he had his disciples right with him so they could see everything he did, everything he said, and they were able to learn from him in that way. So Paul picked up Timothy at Lystra, and they followed on up to the point where they got to Philippi. And this is important in understanding what's happening here, because as Paul planted that church in Philippi, which was the first church in Europe, it was the, the first church as they crossed over into a, a brand new region that Timothy was the co-founder of that church with Paul. You see, Paul wrote the letter to the church saying that he planned to send Timothy just as, as soon as he possibly could. But back in those days, communicating wasn't too easy. Uh, today, it's so easy to communicate, almost too easy. Uh, we had Kelly Olick with us one time and we took her to the airport and I was kind of teasing her because she had her cell phone as a lot of the young people do and she's texting away on the way to the airport and uh, as she gets there, we say our goodbyes, she gets on the plane, we're driving back home and before we even get back home, she's on the airplane flying and she's texting us. You know, and, and today, uh, some of you have received text messages during church, and you just do a quick answer down there. I mean, it's almost like we're just, communication is everywhere. We can call on the phone, we can email individuals, we can write personal letters, we can text people, uh, we can even FaceTime them. Uh, yet, back in those days, it was pretty difficult. If you wanted to get a message to somebody, you either had to take it there yourself by foot, or you had to do it in letter form and have somebody else take that letter. And that's what Paul was hoping to do. If he couldn't go to Philippi himself, there was no one that he would rather have take that letter than Timothy. Timothy was his young assistant. Well, verse 20 says, For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Paul had no one who was like-minded to the sense that they were almost one soul. They were, they were kindred in spirit. He had total confidence in Timothy. Timothy was really special to Paul. As his protege, Paul mentions Timothy 24 times in his writings. That's pretty incredible, isn't it, when you think about that? Timothy was a native of Lystra, where it appears that Paul led his mother Eunice and grandmother Lois to the Lord during the first missionary journey. And Timothy's father was a Greek, and he was a Gentile. So when Paul came to Timothy, originally he was young. When Paul ended up taking Timothy out with him on, on the mission trip during his second missionary journey, Timothy was still a, a young man. But Paul saw the potential, and he worked with him. Warren Wiersbe says, Paul did not add Timothy to his team the very day the boy was saved. Paul was too wise to make an error like that. He left him behind to become a part of the church fellowship in Derby and Lystra. And it was in that fellowship that Timothy grew in spiritual matters and learned how to serve the Lord. You see, as a brand new believer, Paul didn't just take him along. But one thing Paul did is he wanted to see Timothy go ahead and grow in his home church. He wanted to give him the opportunity to begin to develop in that faith and to prove himself. One of the things that troubles me today is we look, and, and so often when a celebrity comes to Christ, we're thrilled about it. And, and we want to make everybody, let it be known that this particular individual has come to Christ. But I'm afraid that so often we put them in the limelight before they've had the opportunity to go through discipleship, before they've had the opportunity to prove their self in the faith. And we set them up for failure. One that's the most recent is Kane West. I mean, you got this former rapper who's come to Christ. That's fantastic news. But when you put somebody right in the forefront before they have the opportunity to grow, before they have the opportunity to prove themselves, it can really hurt the name of the Lord if that person doesn't make it. And I think even today within the church, we need to be careful that when we have young people who come to Christ, that we take the time 
to be able to raise them up so that they're solid in their faith before we put them into positions of leadership. I know that when I came to Christ, it took me a long time. I mean, yeah, I came to Christ, and there were changes in my life, but it was years, actually, to get to, to the point where I would be in a position of, of leadership, and I think each person is different, but we need to be careful. Paul took Timothy through basic training and prepared him for the spiritual warfare that would come. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Paul writes this, he says, you were therefore my, he said, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. You see the need that we have in our faith for passing on that faith to future generations that you're to go through and you're to commit them to faithful men who are going to pass them on. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Quite often, people come to Christ. They say, oh, man, that's, that's, that's great. Everything's going to be fine now. <laughs> Let me ask you this. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, who have you just declared war on? You've declared war on Satan. And he's going to come at you with everything that he has to knock you off of the horse. He's not going to want you to be walking with Christ. He's going to want you to fail. And we need to prepare people that when they step up spiritually, that the enemy is going to attack. He's going to come and try to discourage and try to stop. And Paul reminds Timothy here that he needs to prepare to be a, he's, he needs to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. You see, being a Christian is not easy. And Paul stressed the need for training. We go out and we fight the world. We fight the flesh. We fight the devil. We got all of these things that are coming at us. And for a Christian to walk with Christ, we need to train. We need to prepare ourselves. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7b through 8 say this. Train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. It amazes me that in this world, we get so focused on the things of the world. And Paul's saying, look, you are a soldier of Jesus Christ. You need to train yourself for the battles that are going to be coming. You watch the weightlifter. You know, I'll tell you, those guys go and they go to, and they go. And as they, they lift up their hands like this, they're, they're straining where it gets to the point where it hurts. But over a period of time, what's happening to their body? They're building it up and they're gaining strength. And you've heard the saying before, no pain, no what? No pain, no gain. It's kind of that way in the Christian life too. Because as we get attacked, as we go through difficulties in life, those are the times in which our spiritual growth is accelerated. Those are the times in which we need to depend upon the Lord like never before. And as we see God being faithful, uh, we grow in our faith and our trust. And what are you doing to train yourself? You know, it's really important that every day we spend time in God's Word. Why would we want to have time in the Bible every day? Not legalistically, but out of a love for Him. Why would we want to have time in God's word every day? Because as we, get, as we read through the Bible, we get to know him more deeply. We get to know him more intimately. We get to know him more personally. We spend that time with him. Why would we want to spend time in prayer? Because it's those times in prayer in which we, we draw close to God and, and we get to, to, to see what his will is for our life as we're being conformed to his image. One of the things I started doing years ago you know, you gotta, you got to work out. If you want to grow spiritually, you got to work out. We've got church, we've got Bible studies, we've got different things that we can be doing, and, and all of these things help us out. One of the things that's really helped me out over the years is uh, several years ago I determined I was going to discipline myself to read 10 pages a night in a good Christian book. Now, if you read 10 pages a night in a good Christian book, that's 300 pages a month. The average book you'll see is 150 to 200 pages on average, by doing that discipline, I read 15 to 20 books, sometimes even more than 20 books during the course of a year. 
and it's taken it in little bites. Now, a lot of times we sit there, we watch TV at night, we watch some murder show, and then we go to bed. You know, nice thoughts. Or you watch the news, and you go to bed, and what's happened in the news and in the world's on your mind as you go to bed. But if you get a good Christian book, or if you get the scriptures, and you read through the scriptures just before you go to bed, what is on your mind as you go to sleep? The things of God. And you'll find that as you, if you discipline yourself just that little way, you can read and I, I don't think the average American reads hardly any books now, but you can read 15 to 20 books a year. Well, you can imagine uh, playing press professional football. That's something, uh, I, I like watching football on TV. And uh, when I was in high school, it was really cool. We had the Oakland Raiders, we lived uh, just south of Oakland. Had the Oakland Raiders come to play our teachers in high school uh, in basketball. And so these guys came in they were huge. And back in those days, they didn't have the gym shorts like today that are down to the knees and everything. The gym shorts are like up to here, right? And if you remember those ones. And they had legs that were just massive. And so the only way that they could get into their gym shorts is they snipped the gym shorts right up to the, 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 the elastic band. And they were exploded. And you look at these guys and you think, these guys are monstrous. Now, how did they get to that point? Well, I'll tell you what, they had to shed a lot of sweat. They had to work really hard to get to that point. And I often thought, wouldn't it be fun to go out there and play with the professional football players? <laughs> 350 pounds, six foot four, six foot five, and they're going to come and they're going to tackle you? I'll tell you what, you're going to be crushed. They work out like that because they have to be that strong in order to survive and to do well. And it takes a lot of physical sweat to get to the point where at some point you hold that Super Bowl trophy, you hold that Vince Lombardi trophy, you finally made it, the pinnacle of a career. You've got to sweat a lot to get to that point. But for us to develop spiritually, we've got to bring forth spiritual sweat. We've got to do those things spiritually that are difficult. We've got to do those things to help us grow and to help us become like Jesus. You've got to work at it. Sometime back, I remember watching a Billy Graham crusade, and he was speaking to unbelievers, and this is what Billy said. He said, what do you have to lose by giving your life to Christ? You live a better life and help a, and help a lot of people. You are wrong, you lose nothing. If you are right, you lose everything. Take a look at that again. He said that, I was watching this crusade on television, he came out and it just kind of stood me back because I never looked at it like that. What do you have to lose by giving your life to Christ? Well, you got a better life. I used to think that if we became a Christian, we had to give up all the fun things, you know. Absolutely not. Maybe some of the things that are inappropriate, but as we come as Christians, I've had more fun with the body of Christ as we gather together and we do different things. You know, it, it, you live a better life. You help a lot of people. And if you're wrong, you lose nothing. If there's nothing out there and you're wrong, well, you go to nothing anyways, right? But if you're right, and I believe we are, you gain everything. And you go to heaven. And it makes you wonder why in the world anyone out there wouldn't want to be right with Jesus Christ. Well, Timothy shed that spiritual sweat, and he carried on Paul's ministry even after he was martyred. In fact, that was one of the blessings that Timothy had, was because he had been so faithful that when Paul was martyred, when he lost his life, then Timothy was able to take over for him in a lot of areas. You see, Timothy should be an encouragement to each and every one of us because he was godly, and yet he struggled in many areas as well, just like you and I do. He was young, he was timid, there was times in which he was fearful. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Paul wrote this. He said, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. So part of the issue with Timothy was, was he was young. People wouldn't give him the respect because of his young age. Paul says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, in impurity. With your speech, say things that build up. With your life, set the example even though you're young. With your love, go out there and love other people in a way that draws them to Jesus. And with your faith, go minister 
and impurity be undivided in your love towards Jesus Christ. And one of the things that I love about the Bible is God tells it the way it is. You ever notice that? When I uh, do premarital counseling on people, what I do quite often is I'll tell the people, uh, to maybe, maybe to the groom, I'll say to his potential wife, uh, do you know that your potential wife over here has warts? And they look at me kind of weird, and I'll look at the potential wife and talk about the groom. And do you know that, that he's got warts? And they're looking at me. And what do I mean by that? When we're dating each other, it's so easy to hide those things, isn't it? You're not with each other all the time. Everybody has something in their life, uh, you know, that, that, that's a wart. And, and you can hide those things. But when you come together, those warts come out. And you begin to see it. And I try to deal with that right in the premarital counseling part of it. But the thing that I respect about the Bible so much is like so many other books that are out there, the individuals in the Bible aren't made out to be superheroes. They're made out to be real people. And we see the, the, the problems that they have. We see the challenges that they go through. And it should be an example for you and me because uh, these individuals had weaknesses like we have weaknesses. And yet if there's hope for them, there's hope for us. We know that Timothy had several issues. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, Paul told him, he said, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because your stomach and your frequent illnesses. The water back in those days was horrible, and for some reason, apparently, Timothy wasn't using the staple of wine back there, but he was constantly having stomach problems, and he was frequently ill. And Paul said, look, stop drinking just the water. Use a little wine and medicinal purposes in order to help you out with some of those frequent health issues that you're going through. At times, Timothy was fearful, and he needed encouragement from Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I think right now, as we've been going through this COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people are frightened by this thing. Yet God is in control, and we need to be smart, but at the same time, we can't allow it to control us. We need to realize that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Let me ask you this. Is fear holding you back? I mean, we look out and we are called with a holy call and we are called to, to go out there and minister in the name of Jesus by the grace of God. This has been given to us by Christ Jesus before time began. But are we letting fear stop us? If I were to ask you this, what would you do in ministry if you could? I've shared with you many times that at the moment of regeneration, at the moment of being born again, at the moment that most of us look at, at as that moment of salvation, at that very moment, every Christian is given at least one spiritual gift. Most Christians are given more than one spiritual gift. Those spiritual gifts are for the building up of the body of Christ to the fullness of Christian maturity. And when we're working together, we're like a beautiful puzzle. You ever do a puzzle where one piece is left? You, you didn't get it done? When you put them all together, you get this portrait. And the portrait that we want to put out as the body of Christ is Jesus Christ in all of his glory and in all of his majesty. Are you letting timidity, are you letting fear hold you back from stepping into an area of ministry to serve the Lord that maybe you've never served him before? Well, I hope that you'll continue to, to minister in the name of Jesus and, and step out in those areas in which you're afraid. By facing his fear, Timothy was brave enough that he ended up going to jail for Christ. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 22 through 23, the writer of Hebrews, and, and I say the writer of Hebrews because we don't know who the individual is. Some people think that it was the Apostle Paul. We know that whoever this individual was, he was an acquaintance of Timothy because he refers to him here. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation. For I have written to you in few words, 
Know that our brother Timothy has been set free with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. So even though Timothy was afraid, he continued to serve in ministry and do everything that he can. You know, years ago, uh, public speaking used to absolutely terrify me to the point where if I had to preach, the, the, I would go home at night, the night before, and I would throw up. I mean, it would be that bad. It was absolute, utter terror. But I could have quit at that time and said, look, this is just too hard. I don't want to do it. Or I could continue on and keep facing the fear. And you know what happens when you face the fear? You can overcome that fear. I used to live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and they've got these bridges all over the place, some of them really big. San Mateo's like seven and a half miles long. And people go into panic attacks from these bridges. I know of at least two people in this community that have panic attacks from the North Bend Bridge. They don't want to go over it and back because it just scares them to death. And so I was reading this newspaper article, and what it said is this. It said that the way that the, the counselors were treating these individuals who were so frightened by the bridge, is they would pay them all this money, okay, and then they would get in a car with them, and they'd go back and forth, 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 and back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth again. Why do you think they did that? Because they were showing them that they didn't die. They were showing them that their fears were not grounded. They were showing them that they could do that. And they were normalizing it to the point where they were able to do that. So when we've got fears in our life, so often the, the temptation is to retreat and hide from that. What God would have us to do is face those fears. You see, he hasn't given us a spirit of, of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. How do you conquer your fears? You face them, just like Timothy did. Verse 21, For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ. There are many Christians in Rome. In fact, when Paul ends up writing his book to Romans, at the end of that book in chapter 16, he mentions 26 different individuals from that church. But now he's, he's writing there, and, and as he referenced to it, uh, he says, For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. And William McDonald says the others had become engulfed, uh, engulfed in the ocean of their own private interests. Timothy was devoted to God. Timothy was different than all of them. The others had become engulfed in the ocean of their own private interests. They had become so engrossed with the care of this life, cares of this life, that they had no time for the things which are of Christ Jesus. Does this have a message for us today in our little world of homes and refrigerators and televisions and computers and other things? My th question is, are we guilty of doing the exactly the same thing that we are focusing on ourselves and we are not focusing on Christ? We're not focusing on what Christ would have us to do. Well, what do you think happens in the church setting when everybody does their own thing? You think it would help with the unity, or do you think it would cause division? If everybody in a church is going to go ahead and they're going to do their own thing, you're going to end up having chaos. You're going to have division within the church. God designed us as the body of Christ, and that body is designed to work together towards a common goal. That common goal is reaching people for Christ and to help them grow. Verse 22, but you know his proven character, meaning Timothy. You know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Well, the Philippians could remember back to Acts 16 when Paul showed up there, and uh, Timothy was there along with Silas as well. But what had happened here is for 10 years, the Philippians had known Timothy. For 10 years, Timothy had proven his good character to them by the way in which he had ministered. And so Paul reflects that, that his proven character as a son with his father, he served with me. Well, Timothy had been that co-planner of the church in Philippi. And now notice how Paul began this epistle, this epistle, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops, which means the elders, and the deacons. 
Now, Paul goes ahead and he lists Timothy on there. So that's led some people to say, does that mean that both of them were authors of this letter? And I say, absolutely not. That was not the case here. When you look at Paul and Timothy being mentioned together, why did, as Paul's right in Philippians, why did he put Timothy's name there? And what I have to say is Timothy was a co-founder of the church with Paul. As Paul penned this epistle, Timothy was there with Paul. It was Paul's hope to send Timothy to the Philippians in order to encourage them and find out how that church was going. And so Paul lists them together because they knew him and they were familiar with them. And he lists it here. And Paul continues to build up confidence in the ministry that Timothy would have. But to Paul, the relationship here was more than just co-workers together. In fact, Paul says in verse 22b, he says that as a son with his father, he served with me the gospel. Now, the question comes up, was Timothy Paul's biological son? And we have to say, absolutely not. No, of course not. His father was a Greek. His father was a Gentile. Then why is Paul calling him son? Well, he was the son in the faith. And so what do you mean by a son in the faith? That means that somebody that you've worked with spiritually and you're helping them grow. It's like a father working with their child and they're helping that child grow to to the fullness of, of being an adult in Christ. And in the Jewish culture, the father was expected to train the sons his trade. Now, do you notice what it said back there? Verse 22b, that as a son with his father, he served with me the gospel. Paul says, come with me. I'm going to show you how to share the gospel. I'm going to take you out there. I'm going to train you with me. And that's exactly what he was doing to his son in the faith. Now, it wasn't just Timothy that was Paul's son. We see that there was two other young men in the Bible in which Paul also called his son that he worked with. One of them was Titus and the other one was Anesimus. In verse 23, Paul continues and he says, Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. You see, Paul wanted to send Timothy to Philippi, but what was the delay? Well, once again, I said in our day and age, we pick up the telephone. In our day and age, we go ahead and we send a text message, or we send an email, or we FaceTime, or we Skype, or whatever. But in those days, you had to go by foot. In those days, you had to hand carry a letter or whatever message was going. And it was over 700 miles from where Paul was in Rome all the way over to Philippi. And so Paul was ready to send something back. And we're going to find Epaphroditus does that. He was ready to send something back. But here's the thing. He was waiting for, his, uh, for an answer to his appeal with Caesar. And he was expecting that answer to come at any day. And he didn't want to risk sending Timothy ahead, and then there was no way to get the message out as to what the results were to the hearing that he had gone through. So what he says is, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to hang on to Timothy here until such a time as I can get the message to you and to the other churches in the area, what has happened to me, and give you further instruction. Verse 24, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come to you shortly. Some of the commentators say that as Paul's writing this, he's anticipating his martyrdom, but I don't see that at all at this point because he's saying he's expecting to be released. And when he's released, he's expecting to make the trip over there to Philippi to be with them. He believed that he would be released soon. One of the things that I really appreciate about Paul is even though he was under house arrest and all the difficulties, all the beatings that he went through, Uh, Paul didn't let depression creep in. Paul kept a positive attitude. Have you ever noticed how our attitudes are contagious? You go through and you've had a real bad day. And everybody around you knows that you've had that bad day. You are fuming mad. And people around you are just kind of like, whoa, I'm not even going to deal with that guy because I can just get the vibes here from him. I want you to try something. When we keep a positive attitude, and I want to encourage you to keep a positive attitude this, this week. When we keep an, a positive attitude, people react to us in a very different way from when we have that negative attitude and negative vibes. As you're going through the grocery store, take a couple of minutes extra and purposely smile at per- people. Purposely say hi. Tell the cashier, God bless you, you have a good day. And as you're smiling at people, watch the different way in which people react to you. 
and you can have much more interaction with them in ministering to them. Uh, Paul always kept a positive attitude no matter what was happening. Well, Robert P. Leitner writes, Though the scriptures include no specific statement about Paul's release, it must have occurred since he was imprisoned again in Rome, during which time he wrote his last letter, 2 Timothy. Though there is no record of Paul's revisiting Philippi, he may have returned there after his release. And that's kind of where we're at. We don't know how much further it went. And then as we hit verse 25, we hit a, a transition point here. Because as Paul's been working through here, Paul has given four examples. Well, he's given three so far. Now he's going to give his fourth of what selfless service is. The ultimate example of selfless service was in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, when we saw the Lord Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. Paul lists himself as the second example of selfless service. And then now he's just listed Timothy for selfless service. And now as we hit verse 5, he goes to a fourth individual here, and that's Epaphroditus, uh, who was from Philippi, and we pick up the story. Verse 25, Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Now, Epaphroditus wasn't Jewish. He appeared to be a, a Gentile from Philippi. Why would I say that? Because his name was a very pagan name. It meant favorite of Aphrodite, who was Aphrodite. Aphrodite was the goddess of love. And over time, that name moved from goddess of love to where the word love or loving was mixed in. So Epaphroditus means loving. Well, Epaphroditus was a Christian from Philippi, and when the church wanted to send a love offering to Paul, he's the one who agreed to take it. And as he went, his desire was to help Paul in any way that he could. He came as an assistant. Now, Epaphroditus is mentioned only here. He's mentioned in Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, in all of the Bible. But Epaphroditus made a huge impact, not only upon Paul, but upon every Christian throughout history. Because today, when we open up our Bibles, we read about Epaphroditus. We read about how he almost gave his life in service of Jesus Christ and trying to help Paul. Well, that's the legacy of Epaphroditus. Let me ask you this. What kind of a legacy are you going to leave for your family? What kind of a legacy are you going to leave for your friends? When you die, are they going to remember all the riches you had and uh, all, the, all the secular stuff you went out and did? Or when you die, are they going to remember your love and your, your passion for Jesus Christ? I was watching a video on YouTube last night. It was uh, Candace Owens, and she interviewed Dr. Ben Carson. If you haven't seen that, you've got to see it. What an incredible story, especially on, on Ben Carson. He shared when he was a young boy, uh, he, he was trouble back in those days. And he had one day in which he got really upset. Somebody was bothering him, and he got a knife. And he was going to kill that individual. He was going to stab that individual. And he hit him so hard. The guy had a huge belt buckle, hit him so hard that it broke the knife. And life can change just like that by one decision, you know, that we make. And you look today at Ben Carson and his love for the Lord. I mean, every other word he's talking about, that love for the Lord. But that God protected him with that belt buckle that was there, and his life wasn't ruined at that point. But as that conversation was going on, Candace started talking and she talked back on how she used to be such a rebel just a few years ago. I mean, she was just out there, re rebellious, the whole works. But when she was growing up, her grandmother loved Jesus. And her grandmother continued to work with her. And even as, as later on, as she, she, she got a little bit wild there. She always remembered her, her grandmother's love for Jesus. And guess what? Candace has come back. She loves Jesus at this point. But it was the influence of that grandmother. Who are you influ influencing today? What kind of a legacy are you going to be leaving? Do you realize that only one life will soon be passed? Only what's done for Christ will last. What are you doing for Christ? 
Well, notice that Paul describes Epaphroditus in five different ways in verse 25. Number one, my brother. They were brothers in the faith. Number two, my fellow worker. They worked side by side, almost as equals, if you would. Number three, my fellow soldier. It's a battle when we're walking with Christ. We are involved in spiritual warfare. Number four, your messenger. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But number five, the minister of my needs. You see, Epaphroditus came not just to bring this love offering from the church in Philippi. And by the way, that church three times helped Paul, where you don't hear of other ones doing that. But he was to minister there. But there's another significant thing that would be really easy to see here, and that that's that word messenger has special meaning here. The Greek word can also mean apostle. Now, if I were to ask you, what is the meaning of the word apostle, what would you say? One who is one who is sent. Exactly. So an apostle is one who is sent. And the Greek word that's used for Epaphroditus is apostle, but it's used in the lesser sense. So Epaphroditus was an apostle in the lesser sense of the word. He was sent by the church at Philippi to minister with and to Paul. Now, Paul was an apostle in the fullest sense of the word. He was sent personally by Jesus Christ to minister to the world. Remember the story in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus as, uh, as Saul of Tarsus has that interaction with Jesus and, and his life has changed forever. And he's sent out to minister to the Gentiles. He's sent out to minister to the world. And so here, Paul is a, an apostle, capital A, in the fullest sense of the word, where Epaphroditus is an apostle in a lesser sense of the word. Today, some missionaries would qualify, I think, to be apostles in the lesser sense of the word, in the sense that they are being sent out by the church in order to go out and do ministry. Verse 26, since he, meaning Epaphroditus, was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. When Jessie was 15 years old, she had the opportunity to go to Russia. And she came home one day, and she wanted to talk to me. And I said, yeah, Jess, what's up, hon? And she goes, Dad, God has told me I've got to go to Russia. God is calling me to Russia. I said, are you sure about that? I don't, I don't know about that. Uh, you think maybe he's calling you to the Bahamas? Uh, do you think maybe he's calling you to Texas? Or maybe, Dad... God has called me to Russia. And I said, we don't have the money. If God has called me to Russia, he will provide. Well, not only did he provide the money, but she had another friend that wasn't able to, make, to raise enough money to go, and she was able to help that person get over the hump so that that person could go. So for me, it was really difficult. You're sending your daughter away for the very first time, 15 years old. We go to the airport, and we end up putting her on the plane in Portland, watching that plane go off. She was going to Texas to be trained, but she went by herself. And, and we're thinking, oh, my goodness, we're sending our daughter to Russia. So she gets over to Russia. We find out that she's there. And they sent her to a camp about 100 miles south of St. Petersburg. And uh, the only time we could hear from her is when she came back to St. Petersburg for a little bit. And so one day we get this phone call. Mr. Bernard? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is so-and-so with Teen Mania. Um, your, your daughter is very sick. And we just wanted to let you know uh, that she's sick. We're doing what we can. Um, but I thought you should know. That, sorry about that. Have a good day. Bye. Click. One day, two days, one week, <laughs> a week and a half. Two weeks go by, we didn't hear a word. I'll tell you what, to, you know, your daughter in a foreign country and you're kind of like, oh my goodness, is she okay? Well, she finally was, but I was worried sick. I can understand Epaphroditus' family and friends when there was no way to find out. Then to make it worse, she's finally able to come home, so we're all excited. She's coming back, and she's in Moscow now. I'm going to fly back to New York, and I'm watching my watch. Oh, she should be a couple of hours away from New York City, and the phone rings. Mr. Bernard. Yeah, yeah, that's me. Um, they overbooked the flight, and they left your daughter back in Moscow. <laughs> the good news was she had a couple of leaders with her. But how in the world... Would you take an overbooked flight and you would bump a 15-year-old child? How would you do that? You know, and, and, but during that time, I mean, to say that I was worried, I was concerned. 
And you see, Epaphroditus' family knew something was wrong, and they were concerned. And both Epaphroditus and Paul wanted to make sure that they knew that he was okay. Notice that Paul, <clears throat> as he writes the Philippians, he wanted them to realize how sick Epaphroditus had been. He had almost given his life in service for the Lord. Verse 27, for indeed he was sick almost to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. You see, Epaphroditus almost died until God intervened and he healed him. Now, interestingly enough, we find out in the Bible that the Apostle Paul had the gift of healing. In Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 14, it says this. It says, And in Lystra a certain, that's the town of Timothy, and in Lystra a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul observed him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed, he said in a loud voice, Stand up, straight on your feet. And he leaped up, and he walked. Wow, can you imagine that? Paul had the gift of healing. Remember the young man that fell asleep on the third-story window, fell down, came down, and raised him from the dead. Why couldn't he heal Epaphroditus? How come Epaphroditus was having all of the problems that he was having? Paul couldn't heal Trophimus. Paul couldn't heal himself. Paul had a thorn in his side in which he pleaded with God three times to remove it. But the Lord replied, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. You know, it's during those times of weakness that we turn to the Lord, isn't it? It's during those times of weakness that we cling to the foot of the cross. But William MacDonald brings out some points in this section of Scripture that offers some invaluable insights when it comes to divine healing. Number one, sickness is not always the result of a person's sin. I'll say that sickness is the result of Adam's sin because we wouldn't have any sickness if it wasn't for that. But so often people think, well, that person must have sinned. And that's not necessarily the case. It wasn't the case with Epaphroditus. He almost died serving the Lord in ministry. So sickness is not always the result of a person's sin. Secondly, it's not always God's will to heal instantly and miraculously. Sometimes God heals ultimately. What do I mean by ultimately? Sometimes God gives us the ultimate healing. He takes us into his very presence in heaven, and we see him in all of his glory, in all of his majesty, where there's no more sin, there's no more suffering, there's no more tears, there's no more crying, there's no more death. That's the ultimate healing that each and every one of us have to look forward to. And then third, healing is a mercy from God and not something that we can demand from him as being our right. We can't demand that. So what do you do when a loved one's sick? What do you do if, if maybe God's not going to answer the prayer in the way that you want him to answer the prayer? You know what you do? You pour your heart out in prayer. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. Charles Spurgeon uh, puts it like nobody else. You know, the question, why do, why do you pray if God already knows what he's going to do? Why should you even pray? And this is what Spurgeon says. He says, our prayers are in the predestination and that God has as much ordained his people's prayers as anything else. And when we pray, we are producing the links in the chain of ordained facts. Destiny decrees that I should pray. I pray. Destiny decrees that I shall be answered and the answer shall come. Why should we pray? Do you realize that when you're praying for the needs of a particular individual that your prayers are in the predestination of God? They're in that chain of ordained facts that happen, and God told us to pray. He said to call unto me, and I will, I will answer you and show you great and mighty things in which you do not know. We are to pray, and Spurgeon's pointing out that don't ever give up because God's all-knowing. Somehow, all of this is all worked together for his glory. 
Well, in this particular case, God decided to heal Epaphroditus. And I think it's important to note here that Epaphroditus' illness was directly related to his service for Christ. William MacDonald said, this is of great value in the eyes of the Lord. It is better to burn out for Christ than to rust out. It is better to die in the service of Jesus than to be counted a mere statistic among those who die from illness and accident. Are you burning out or are you rusting out? As I get older in life, I come to the realization I've got less time to serve the Lord. I've got less time to accomplish those things that I've hoped that I would. So many of us uh, uh, just, just love to say, well, I've, I've done my work in the past. I'm just going to kick back. And I'll tell you what, I'd rather burn out. I'd rather burn out on a Sunday up here or somewhere else than I would uh, to rust out and not be reaching people for Christ. Because there's one thing that you cannot do in heaven. Do you know what that one thing that you cannot do in heaven is? You can't evangelize. The evangelization has to be done. The evangelizing has to be done here and now. Verse 28, therefore I sent him the more eagerly, and when you see him again, you may, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Now, as we go through this book, we realize that Paul is in prison. He's under house arrest. He may get executed, and eventually he will get executed. And he's writing with joy. He's writing with the word, not only joy, but rejoice over and over again. This is the book of joy. And joy is so much different than happiness. Joy you can have even in the most difficult of times. But for Paul, he rejoiced in sending Epaphroditus back with this epistle alive. He could have been dead. But now he's thrilled that he's recovered enough that he can go ahead and he can send him back home and, and that they can relax. And when people put their lives on the line for Christ, we should honor them. And that's exactly what Paul does with Epaphroditus, with these words. Verse 29, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men, those who put their lives on the line, hold such men in esteem. Back in the early 1900s, there was a, a missionary couple that had served the Lord for 40 years in Africa. It got to the point where they're getting too old to minister anymore, and they did come home at that point. So they got on a ship, and they headed back to the United States. And as they all uh, got topside and, and uh, they are just watching as they were coming into the piers and everything, they were amazed as they looked and they saw that the piers were covered with people. But the people that were there were reporters. And it turned out that Teddy Roosevelt was on that same ship and that Teddy Roosevelt had gone on a hunt in Africa to kill animals. And the press was everywhere to greet the former president as he arrived back. The missionary couple who had served so hard and for so long were disheartened to see how the world would re respond to a man who had gone hunting and to them who had given their lives in service of Jesus Christ. They went to their hotel room that night still downcast and struggling and then the husband said that it dawned on him suddenly. He said, this isn't our real homecoming. That's yet to come. The real homecoming is going to be in heaven. Amen? And we may not see all that's going to happen in this world, and we may not be greeted with great crowds that are out there, but I'll tell you what the angels celebrate when a job is well done. And one of these days, hopefully, we'll hear from the Lord as he celebrates. And he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, Epaphroditus worked hard for the Lord, and he almost died doing it. Verse 30 says, because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service to me. That's an odd statement. What does he mean, what was lacking in your servants to me? If you look up at the board, you'll see a map up here. And what was lacking? You remember I said from Rome to Philippi was over 700 miles. And so you've got this huge distance that you can't communicate. But the people ended up sending Epaphroditus from Philippi to Rome to bring the love offering to Paul. 
and to minister to his needs. So what was lacking from Philippi was because of distance. It was because they couldn't go. And they sent Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus was able to minister. Now the other key point I mentioned briefly earlier, but out of all of the churches that are mentioned in Scripture, there's one that's mentioned that three different times, even though Paul wasn't asking for help, three different times one church jumped up and they helped him financially, and that was the church of Philippi. Well, question. When you hear the word missionary, what do you think? Do you think of somebody in a far-off country? Do you think maybe somebody in another state that's out there and they're, they're ministering? Or is it possible to be a missionary in our own community? And I think it is. And I think every Christian is called to be a missionary for Jesus Christ. We are to go out and we are to do our very best that we can to reach other people for Christ. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 15 says this. How then can they call on one whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, for each and every one of us in here who is a Christian, somebody has been a Romans 10, 14 through 15 Christian for us. Somebody has accepted the call to come. Somebody has accepted that challenge. Somebody has shared the gospel with us. Somebody has been used in how beautiful their feet are as they bring the good news. I think for each and every one of us, it's important that we try to become Romans 10, 14 through 15 Christians to other people within our community. How many of you realize that Jim Elliott is from Portland? Did you realize? Portland's own Jim Elliott, born 1927. And in 1956, Jim Elliott, along with four others, headed off to Ecuador in what was called Operation Aka. And the goal there was to establish communication with the Aka Indians and hopefully be able to reach this unreached group of the gospel of Christ. They did it by flying in with an airplane, and uh, the first time they flew in, people came to them, they talked to them, they had great conversations with them. But unbeknown to them, they didn't realize that one of the women who was in that group went back to the tribe that day, and she lied about them. And so they went home that night, they were all excited, they were praising God for, for that initial contact with the hope that they'd eventually be able to reach these people for Jesus Christ. And so they ended up coming back the next day, and they landed. They're on the radio, and they're talking to their wives, and it was a Sunday, and, and they're really looking forward to the opportunity to be able to minister to these, these natives, and they looked, and the, the brush started to move, and before they knew it, they began to come in, but things were a little bit different that day, and because of that lie that that lady told, all five of them were killed with spears. Their family members were back at the camp. I can't imagine going through that. In fact, I think if I was in that situation, uh, I would probably, as soon as it was done, be looking at heading back home, getting out of there. But Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot, the new wife of Jim Elliot, along with one or two of the other wives, they said, no, we're not going to leave. This is the mission field that God has called us to. And it turned out that one of the ladies that they were working with was an Aka Indian, and she opened up the door so that they could have more communication with the tribe. And you know what Elizabeth Elliot did? She took her three-year-old daughter, and she went with another wife, and they went right into the middle of that camp. The Aka Indian lady arranged to help get them in there, and they stayed there. And they began to minister to the people who were in the camp that killed her husband. And you know what happened? Those people ended up coming to Christ. Now, one of the individuals, Nate Sane, his son ended up, <laughs> his son Steve ended up being baptized by the very man who speared his father to death. And he became so close to that individual. Can you imagine this? That he called him dad. The man who killed his father. And even today, 20% of that tribe is Christian. And Jim Elliott and the others, they gave their lives to reach these people for Jesus Christ. Are we even willing to walk across the street to tell somebody about Jesus Christ today? 
Jim Elliott said this. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Well, what can't you keep? Well, we can't keep our human bodies. We're going to end up dying. But when these people come to Christ, then they're in heaven forever, aren't they? And so he says, he's no fool who can keep, uh, he's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And he did it all. He gave his life. Billy Graham puts it this way. You possess a non-renewable resource. That resource is your time. You can either invest your life or let it dribble through your fingers like sand in an hourglass. With the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you can make your days count. Read that again. You possess a renewable resource. That's time. Are we wasting it? Are we using it? That resource is time. You can either invest your life or let it dribble through your fingers like sand in an hourglass. With the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you can make your days count. Jim Elliott gave his life. What are you giving in your service for the Lord? Are you timid like Timothy was? If you are, then I challenge you to, to face those fears and press on, realizing that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And if you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'll tell you, the Bible tells us that we're sinners in need of a Savior. There's nothing that we need more. The most important thing that can happen to anyone in their entire life is coming to Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I encourage you that you don't push it off and walk out of here without, without dealing with that situation because we may not have a tomorrow. And today counts forever. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, this message from the Apostle Paul today. And I pray, Lord, for each of us that we would be able to fight those fears that we may be feeling, especially when it comes to ministry and especially when it comes to reaching people for Christ. Lord, I pray right now that if there's anyone here today who's never received Jesus as their Savior, that they wouldn't leave so without, without doing so. Uh, and maybe just repeat the, this prayer after me, realizing that it's not a magical formula, but what matters is the state of the heart. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Lord, I have sinned. I have done so many wrongs in my life, and I ask you to forgive me for that. Lord, I repent. I change my mind. I change my direction, and I cling to you. I cling to the foot of the cross. Lord, come into my life and help me be the kind of person that you desire for me to be. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can you please stand with us as we go uh, finish rejoicing? He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. With every chain will break, his broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. So open up the gates, make way before the king of kings. A God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Who can stop 
the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Amen. Would you, would you please be seated? I, I need five more minutes. So I'm going to ask David and Carrie Kim, uh, along with their beautiful little baby, to come on up here. Uh, it's not every day that the Kims are here. David and Carrie are one of our missionary couples here at Shoreline. Uh, we've got 14 different missionaries and, uh, and mission organizations that we support. But David and Carrie, we've, we've been doing it for quite a while. This is your home church, and I just wanted to to go ahead and say welcome again. <laughs> All right, good. Okay. <laughs> well, hello. How are you doing? Says, I don't know. But I'm going to ask David if he could share a little bit on what's going on with their ministry. They just moved from Seattle to Orlando. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are you on? Is this? Yep. All right. Yeah, it's good to be, be back here uh, with our Shoreline family. Um, we were telling the guys in the first service, uh, this is especially... Uh, heartwarming for us because this is our first in-person church service that we've been at since probably mid-March, and, and it's good to be worshiping alongside you guys. Um, yeah, things in Orlando certainly haven't been what we uh, expected, uh, as I'm sure uh, that the, the past, you know, set six months uh, has, has been pretty turbulent with the coronavirus, but in the midst of social distancing, we've seen God do some really creative things um, in Orlando. Uh, we've been able to especially uh, play a large role in equipping churches in understanding technology and, and the way that uh, that can uh, further their ministry. And so I can think of uh, specifically one Latino church in Orlando uh, that, you know, naturally had one service every Sunday. Uh, and with the coronavirus, that, that has gone digital. And, and uh, since, since that start, um, we've seen uh, 10 Bible studies a week going on. And so, you know, their head pastor is a little tired uh, and weary from all the uh, additional, you know, Bible studies that um, his, his leaders are, are leading. But uh, the, the reach that they're seeing is, is growing uh, on right. a daily basis. And then even, out, even before the coronavirus, um, we had some, some, uh, a really cool opportunity to minister to some college students that came down from Minneapolis. And we didn't really understand, you know, what God was going to do with that, but they came in for some urban ministry training. Uh, we talked about things like poverty um, and race, and, and also just really grasping the understanding of uh, what it means to follow Christ. And if we think about it as a two-sided coin, you know, there's the cognitive understanding of what it means to, to love the Lord, but then there's the flip side of that, right, of what it means to live rightly um, uh, in the body of Christ. And so um, it's in the midst of, of all of that training, uh, now to see uh, some of the, the racial tension that we're seeing in Minneapolis and around the country, it's been really cool to see these students equipped um, to lead out in their churches um, and to speak prophetically about what it means to follow Christ uh, today. So that's kind of a snapshot of what ministries look like, um, and we're really grateful for you guys and, and your part in that. Well, I see your family is growing. Would you introduce us to yeah, your, your yeah. youngest and your newest? So you, obvi you guys obviously know Carrie. Uh, this is Elizabeth. Hey, uh, Elizabeth. She just turned, what, 11 months a couple days ago. Um, let's see. I don't, I don't know who she looks like more, but um, she's, <laughs> we, she's... We need to get a mask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's, uh, she's been a lot of fun. Um, I think the last time she was here, she couldn't even lift her own head. So, What's uh, been some of the biggest challenges being in Orlando? Yeah. Uh, Carrie, do you want to? Okay. All right. <laughs> some of the biggest challenges, I think um, one of the things that I see keenly in the Northwest is uh, it's, it's a hard place to know Christ, right, and to follow Christ. Uh, and so I feel like when we see believers... Uh, 
there's, there's kind of an understanding uh, of what it means to, uh, to love Jesus. Um, and I think in, in other areas of the country, and I think Orlando included, um, to be a Christian uh, is, can, can sometimes blur into what it means to be culturally Southern. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, just kind of navigating uh, through some of that. And then naturally, you know, the coronavirus has, has isolated people um, uh, and, and so in some ways, the local church has been, I think, a beacon of what it means and how God created us to be in community. Uh, yeah. One of the uh, things I've been praying for them specifically is that God would build a team around them because they've, they've left their team in the Seattle area. Uh, actually, crew ministries moved you, right? Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that they wanted to, but they, they went ahead and went over to Orlando. And so now we need to be praying that God brings the right team so they can be effective. One of the great things about Orlando is uh, people come from all over the world because I I went to that airport. I couldn't believe how crowded it was. What a great opportunity to minister, and we're excited you're there and and with all those opportunities. So let's just pray. And Lord, I do thank you so much for David and Carrie and for Elizabeth. Uh, We pray for them as they uh, really begin to dig in now in this ministry in Orlando and that you would use them in powerful ways above and beyond anything that they ever imagined or expected. God, I pray that as people fr- come from all over the world, that you would give them unique opportunities to minister and that we would see many people coming to faith in Christ. And so we ask that you would protect them. We ask that you would help them. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would be them with the financial needs that they, that, that they have. And uh, Lord, that this move would be a tremendous thing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So David and Carrie are going to be around for a few minutes if you wanted to say hi. And let's close in a word of prayer. Really appreciate you being here. Happy Father's Day. The fathers, I think, are getting ready for their lunch. Huh? <laughs> gotta, gotta be good. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can gather here to worship you. And uh, just once again, we want to thank you for all the dads who are here on Father's Day and pray that this would be a very special day for each and every one of them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You're excused. Thank mm-hmm. you.